What up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mel, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Friday, November 2nd, 2018, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash entertainment report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, on Twitter at The Enter Report, or on Instagram at The Entertainment Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio, just go to iHeartRadio dot com or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainer Report and it'll take you to the page. Will Smith and Martin Lawrence have confirmed on Instagram that they'll be reuniting for a third entry in the Bad Boys series. Smith said on Thursday alongside a video of himself and Lawrence on the beach, it's been a long time coming, but now it's here at Bad Boys for Life. We're back at Martin Lawrence. The third film in the action comedy series will be titled Bad Boys for Life. Smith and Lawrence will be reprising their roles as Miami detectives Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett, respectfully. Smith said excitedly in the clip, it's official, baby. It's official. Bad Boys 3 is happening. Bad Boys for Life has a release date of January 17th, 2020. Filmmaker Adil El Arabi and Bilal Falah are set to direct the film in place of Michael Bay, who helmed the first two films. The animated sequel Frozen 2 has a new release date and will now hit theaters on November 22nd, 2019. The new release date moves the film up one week and puts it before the Thanksgiving holiday. Frozen 2 was originally scheduled for release on November 27th, 2019. Kristen Bell and Adina Menzel are set to reprise their roles as Anna and Elsa respectfully along with Josh Gad as re- returning as Snowman Olaf. Frozen Helmers Jennifer Lee and Chris Buck are directing once again based on a script by Allison Schroeder and Lee and Evan Rachel Wood and Sterling K. Brown are in talks to join the vocal cast. The original Frozen is the highest grossing animated film of all time, her earning $1.3 billion worldwide. Bell previously teased the sequel in April, calling it very good. She says, I know the songs, I know the story, it's very good. I can't say much more than that, or I'll get in trouble. Oscar winning actor Forrest Whitaker is to play an inventor who falls on rough times in Netflix's Jingle Jangle. The streaming service says in a press release, a cobblestone world comes to life in the event holiday musical tale of an embattled toy maker, his precarious granddaughter, and a magical invention that, if they can get it to work in time for the holidays, could change their lives forever. David E. Talbert wrote the film and plans to direct it next year for a scheduled 2020 debut. Um, Talbert's wife and producing partner Lynn Cizan Talbert tweeted Jingle Jangle is heating up so thankful to have Oscar winner Forrest Whitaker in our film hashtag what hashtag dreams come true hashtag mama wearing makeup a movie uh, Mama, we're making a movie, rather. Whitaker's other credits includes The Godfather of Harlem, Black Panther, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, The Butler, Arrival, and The Last King of Scotland. Netflix announced it will provide exclusive limited theatrical releases to some films prior to their debut on the streaming service. Alfonso Cuaron's Roma, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs from the Coen Brothers, and Bird Box from Suzanne Breyer will be released at theaters in selected cities before they are officially made available for streaming, Netflix wrote on Twitter on Wednesday. The company also announced that when the films will be available to stream with Roma arriving on December 14th, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs on November 16th, and Bird Box on December 21st. Prior to the streaming debuts, Roma will have ex- exclusive limited theatrical engagements in Los Angeles, New York, and Mexico beginning November 21st. More engagements in U.S. cities and London will begin November 29th, and showings at other top U.S. market and international territories will begin to roll out after the 7th 7th deadline reported. Roma will have a wider theatrical release once it is available for streaming on December 14th, and will ultimately be released in more than 20 territories globally, with 70mm presentations planned for some other theaters. Limited theatrical engagements for the Ballad Buster Scruggs will begin in the Landmark in Los Angeles, the Landmark 57 West in New York, the Emperor Cardedero Center Cinema in San Francisco, and the Curzon Theater in London. Beginning on December 13th, Bird Box will have exclusive limited theatrical engagements in London, Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. Both films will also have a larger theatrical releases once they begin streaming on Netflix. The move will look to provide the films a greater opportunity to contend for the Oscars and other film awards. Scott Stuber, the head of Netflix's film group, says, Netflix's priority is our members and our filmmakers, and we are constantly innovating to serve them. 
Our members benefit from having the best quality films from world-class filmmakers, and our filmmakers benefit by being able to share their artistry with the largest possible audience in over 190 countries worldwide. Actress and rapper Aquafina will host the 2018 Hollywood Film Awards. Dick Clark Productions announced in a, tr- in a press release Thursday that the 29-year-old Crazy Rich Asian star will MC the 22nd Annual Ceremony Sunday. The 2018 Hollywood Film Awards will be taking place at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills, California. The annual awards showcases celebrations, achievements in film, and kicks off the award season. Nicole Kidman will receive the Hollywood Career Achievement Award during the ceremony. Glenn Close and Hugh Jackman will be honored with the Hollywood Actress Award and the Hollywood Actor Award, respectively. In addition, Agofina and the Crazy Rich Asians cast will receive the Hollywood Breakout Ensemble Award. Damien Chazelle will be honored with the Hollywood Director Award, with Timothy Chamolet will receive the Hollywood Supporting Actor Award. The Hollywood Film Awards confirm Aquafina as host in the tweet Thursday. The post reads, at Aquafina from at Crazy Rich Movie is hosting the hashtag Hollywood Awards this Sunday. Aquafina played Gok Peak Lin in Crazy Rich Asians, which opened in theaters in August. She also appeared in the movies Neighbors 2, Sorority Rising, and Ocean's 8. Game of Thrones fans can expect the show to have a haunting and bittersweet final season. Co-executive producer Brian Cogman and stars Amelia Clark and Kit Harrington teased season 8 of the HBO series on the November 9th issue of Entertainment Weekly. Cogman told the magazine, It's all about all these disparate characters coming together to face a common enemy, dealing with their own past, and defining the character they want to be in the face of certain death. He also added, it's an incredible, emotional, haunting, bittersweet final season, and I think it honors very much what author George R. R. Martin set out to do, which is flipping this kind of story on its head. Game of Thrones is based on Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire book series. Clark and Harrington, who played Daenerys Targaryen and Jon Snow, said the cast endured a demanding 10-month shoot to film the final six episodes. Harrington says it's relentless. Scenes that would have been a one-day shoot five years ago are now a five-day shoot. They wanted to get it right. They wanted to shoot everything every single way so they have options. Harrington said in a previous interview with Deadline that he was feeling the weight of fan expectations. He told the publication he fears the eighth and final season will let people down. The actor shared, I think there's a certain pressure I've not felt before. He says, obviously, we don't want to let the people down, so we're very much stepping up at everyone's game, which is very apparent, at least to me. We're all growing a bit, and I think everyone's attention is focused on what we're doing. Game of Thrones Season 8 will premiere in December, uh, uh, rather, in 2019. HBO is developing a prequel series starring Naomi Watts and Josh Whitehouse that is set thousands of years before the events of Game of Thrones. Domesticity will be a welcome cha- uh, rather change or challenge for Claire and Jamie in season four of Outlander, which debuts Sunday on Stars. The latest chapter of the sci-fi romance finds the lovers, played by Katrina Balfi and Sam Hewen, beginning their new lives together in 18th century North Carolina, following a time travel induced 20-year separation and death-defined exploits that took them from Scotland to France to Jamaica. Balfi told the crowd at New York Comic Con, it is much more settled and content place that we have ever gotten to explore before. Obviously, it's Outlander, so there's always going to be external forces, but I don't think there are cliffhangers again about whether this couple will stay together or not. That's pretty certain that they are solid. Alfie said at another event at the Paley Center for Media in New York that Claire and Jamie's innate personalities aren't transformed because they are living somewhere new. She says, we're telling the story of immigrants arriving in a new country, and generally people, when they arrive somewhere, they retain so much from where they came from. It's that way of bridging that gap of who you are and this new place that you're in. However, Hewen thinks the characters are profoundly impact because the new world represents freedom and opportunity. Hewen says, We are constantly dealing with the drama in previous seasons of trying to find each other or trying to find a place to stay, and here finally they find that and the land of America seems to be a very positive place for them. There's a lot of danger, obviously, but they are together at least. Based on a Diana Gabaldon's novel, the show begins when Claire, a British World War II nurse, is magically transported to perilous mid 17 1700s Scotland, where she falls in love with and marries Highland warrior Jamie. Pregnant and fearful that Jamie has died in battle, she returns to her own time and first husband Frank, with whom she spent two decades raising her daughter. 
When Brianna is grown, Frank announces that he wants a divorce but dies in a car crash before it's finalized. Freed from a loveless marriage and armed with evidence that Jamie survived the war, Claire goes back to the 18th century to find him. Trailers and interviews have hinted that Brianna, played by Sophie Skelton, will eventually follow her mother into the past. Sideways and designated survivor actress Virginia Madsen is to star in the new live action series Swamp Thing. The DC Universe Twitter feed said Thursday Virginia Madsen at Mad, uh, Mad LYV joins the hashtag DCU Swamp Thing as Maria Sunderland. Welcome to the hashtag DC Universe. Got the Malone Crystal Reed was cast in September's Abby a Crane and the Louisiana said supernatural drama. Deadline.com said that the show is slated to debut in 2019. No casting has been announced yet. James Wan. Uh, Mark Vehemend, uh, Gary Dalber, and Michael Clear, the team behind the horror hits The Conjuring, It, and Annabelle, are adapting the comic book property from the new DC Universe digital subscription service, which is the home of Titans. Len Wiseman, whose credits include Slippy Hollow and the Underworld franchise, is directing Swamp Thing. Production is to begin next year on the horror drama Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Set in 1930s California, the series is a follow-up to Penny Dreadful, which took place in late 19th century London. The original show starred Josh Harnett, Eva Green, Pat Lapone, Harry Treadwell, and Timothy Dalton. It ran on the cable network from 2014 to 2016. It is now streaming on Netflix. Penny Dreadful creator, writer, and executive producer John Logan is also on board for City of Angels, which is a press release, said it would steep in the Mexican-American folklore and social tensions of the era. No casting for the new show has been announced yet. Logan said in a, in a statement Thursday, Penny Dreffel, City of Angels, will have a social consciousness and historical awareness that we chose not to explore in the Penny Dreffel London storylines. He also added, we will now be grappling with specific historical and real-world political, religious, and social and racial issues. 1938, Los Angeles has faced some hard questions about its future and its soul. Our character must do the same. There are no heroes or villains in this world, only protagonists and antagonists, complicated and conflicting characters living on the fulcrum of moral choice. Jersey Shore star Mike the Situation Sorrentino is a married man. Us Weekly confirmed the 36-year-old television personality tied the knot with Lauren Pesky at a wedding Thursday at the Legacy Ca- Castle in Pompton Plains, New Jersey. Sorrentino's Jersey Shore co-stars Jenny J. Wow Farley, Nicole Snooky Pelizzi, Ronnie Ortiz Magrell, Polly Polly D. Del Vecchio, Vinny Gardrellino, uh, Dina Nicole Cortez and Angelina Pinervec were among the guests in attendance. Sorrentino and Pesky told the magazine, We are so incredibly excited to be again our journey as husband and wife. They added, We are each other's best friend and together we can handle anything. Thank you to all of our family, friends, and fans who have supported us every step of the way. Jim Tans Lawrence is the new GTL. Sorrentino had dedicated sweet pearls to Pesky on Instagram ahead of their nuptials. The star wrote, Today I married my best friend, my college sweetheart, my everything. Together as a team, we can accomplish anything. He says, I am so grateful that you are by my side. I promise to be my best self every day and make you proud to call yourself Mrs. Sorrentino. I love you with all my heart. Here's to our big day today. Sorrentino got engaged to Pesky on Jersey Shore family vacation in April. His co-stars helped him pull off the dream proposal in Miami. Uh, Pesky said at the time, my dream ring, my dream man, and dream proposal couldn't have asked for anything more. Thank you, my love, at It's the Situation, and to your amazing friends that went above and beyond for us in Miami. We are so blessed. Sorrentino is known for starring on the MTV series Jersey Shore and Jersey Shore Family Vacation. Hulu announced it has ordered 10 episodes of Dollface, a new comedy starring Two Broke Girls alum Kat Dennings. Dennings is set to executive produce the comedy alongside creator and writer Jordan Weiss and showrunner Ira uh, Unger Leader. Matt Spicer is also executive producing the project, which will begin filming in 2019. He plans to direct the first episode of the series about someone trying to reconnect with the women in her life after a bad breakup with her longtime boyfriend. And he said in the statement Friday, reading Jordan's script was like opening a window into my own brain. I'm so inspired by the stellar team we have around us and the unique world of this show, especially with Matt Spicer at the helm. Two Broke Girls ran for six seasons on CBS from 2011 to 2017. 
Dennings' former co-star, Beth Bears, recently booked a role on the network's new show, The Neighborhood. The Ranch has been renewed at Netflix for season four. The streaming uh, company confirmed in a tweet Wednesday that the comedy will return for a 20-episode fourth season. Netflix shared a promo image of Ashton Kutcher, Deborah Winger, Sam Elliott, and Esha Sherbet as their characters Colt Bennett, Maggie Bennett, Bo Bennett, and Abby Phillips Bennett. Uh, the company captioned the photo, hashtag the ranch has been renewed for a 20-episode fourth season. Uh, Winger had let the news slip during Tuesday's episode of Watch What Happens Live. The 63-year-old actress told host Andy Cohen, it's back. There are 20 new ones being shot. I may or may not be in them. The ranch just centers on the uh, Bennetts, a dysfunctional family living in a small ranching town in Colorado. Danny Masterson was written out of the show in season three following multiple sexual allegations. Alec Baldwin was arrested in New York on Friday after alleging punching some, allegedly punching someone during a dispute about a parking spot. Police confirmed the 60-year-old actor who had been making headlines during the past two years for playing President Donald Trump on Saturday Night Live was arrested Friday in the West Village. Investigators said Baldwin allegedly punched a man during an argument about a parking space. Baldwin is expected to be charged with third-degree assault, police say. The actor was previously arrested on the disorderly conduct charge in 2000. 14. He was acquitted of battery in the 1990s after allegedly fighting with a photographer. Amy Schumer is giving fans a first glimpse of her baby bump. The pregnant 37-year-old actress and comedian showed off her growing belly during an outing with friends Thursday following news she's expecting with husband Chris Fisher. Schumer shared a photo on Instagram of herself flashing a section of bare belly. The mom-to-be was enjoying a walk with her sister Kim Carmel and a friend. The I Feel Pretty Star captioned the post with the family of three emoji. Fans congratulate Schumer on her pregnancy in the comments. One person wrote, congrats, Amy, being a mom is amazing. Life just gets better. Another added, congrats to you and your family. Babies are the biggest blessing ever. Uh, Schumer announced her pregnancy with the help of friend and former CNN correspondent Jessica Yellen in October. She and Fisher married in a surprise ceremony in February after a few months of dating. The star said on the You Up with Nikki Glaser podcast show the same month, part of the thing that's good about us getting married so quickly is that we're so in love. She also added of calling Fisher her spouse, I'm a wife as hell, but it's still like a novelty. I just have been really overusing it to a degree that's insane, like when it's completely uncalled for. Ray Wilson is responding to fans who criticized her recent comment about being a plus-size actress. The 38-year-old Australian star spoke out on Thursday on Twitter after declaring herself the first plus-size actress to star in a romantic comedy. Wilson, who stars in the new movie Isn't It Romantic, responded to a fan who pointed out Queen Latifah and Monique had previously played leads in romantic comedies. Uh, she wrote, Hey girl, yeah. I, of course, know of these movies, but it was a questionable as to whether, one, technically those actresses were plus size when filming those movies, or two, technically those films are categorized billed as studio room com with sole leads. So there's a slight gray area. Wilson had made the remark while celebrating her new role on Wednesday's episode of The Ellen DeGeneres Show. She told host Ellen DeGeneres, I'm kind of proud of being the first ever plus-size girl to be the star of a romantic comedy. Fans called out Wilson on social media while many citing Queen Latifah and Monique as the true trailblazers for plus-size women in romantic comedies. Others mentioned Melissa McCarthy, Kathy Bates, Anna Garcia, and Ricky Lake. One person wrote, Oh, we just ignore the string of films Queen Latifah did when she was cast herself opposite every fine black man imaginable. Don't get me wrong, her movies look cute, but what we're not going to do is erase a rom-com pioneer. Another added, here we have another example of the work of black women who did it first being erased. Queen Latifah and Monique uh, both started romantic comedies. Isn't a Romantic opens on Valentine's Day in February. The movie co-stars Liam Hemsworth, Adam Devine, and Priyanka Chopra and released the first trailer this week. Barbara Streisand joined Late Late Show host James Corden to sing a number of her classic songs in the newest edition of Carpool Karaoke. Streisand was featured on the popular segment on Thursday, picking up Corden in her car after the late night host discovered that his vehicle was given a wheel clamp. The pair sang together Streisand's duet with Donna Summer, No More Tears, Enough is Enough, from the film 
uh, the way we were. Uh, Don't Rain on My Parade from Funny Girl. Mashups of Imagine What a Wonderful World and the Politically Charged Don't Lie to Me from her recent release, 36 Album Walls. Streisand said, Don't tell me not to live, just sit and putter. Life's candy and the sun's a ball of butter. Streisand and Corden does also discuss how this music and film legend suffered from stage fright, how she's not the greatest driver, and how she once phoned Apple CEO Tim Cook in order to get Siri to pronounce her name correctly. Streisand said about performing in front of live audiences in her stage fright, I don't get nervous, nervous, but I do enjoy it. I get scared. I just don't want to disappoint people. She told Corden about how she says, let go and let God before taking the stage. Justin Timberlake hosted a round of Best Friend Challenge on The Tonight Show between his wife, Jessica Beale and Jimmy Fallon. The competition, which took place on Thursday, involved Timberlake asking random questions about himself to see who knew him best. Timberlake was unable to speak during his Tonight Show appearance, having to relay on cue cards to communicate. Timberlake is suffering from severely bruised vocal cords, which recently caused the pop star to delay an October concert in New York City to his birthday on January 31st. Timberlake first asked his wife and close friend who his all-time favorite rapper is, explained that the question had two answers. Beale won the round after correctly writing down Mace and Andre 3000, while Fallon failed by jolting down Run DMC. Timberlake then asked what is his go-to cocktail, with Beale once again winning by answering Tequila Meal. Fallon was shocked that his answer of gin and tonic was incorrect. Fallon said, we drink gin, gin and tonics. That's what we drink. You don't like what I do for you. Beale and Fallon correctly answered pineapple when asked what is Timberlake's safe word. Timberlake, for the final round, then asked what number he was thinking of between 1 and 5,000. Fallon got the answer right by writing down 4,297 after Timberlake had helped them cheat. Bale then left the Tonight Show stage in disappointment with Fallon chasing after her. South Korean band BTS have another music video passing 300 million views on YouTube. The K-pop group's agency Big Hit Entertainment confirmed BTS reached a milestone on Wednesday with its video for Save Me, according to the Korea Herald. Save Me appears on the BTS compilation album The Most Beautiful Moment in Life, Young Forever. The album also includes the singles Epilogue, Young Forever, and Fire. Save Me is BTS's seventh music video to pass 300 million views on YouTube, the greatest number of any South Korean act. The group's video for its Mic Drop remix reached 300 million views in July. BTS last released the album Love Yourself Answer in August. The group is promoting the album on a worldwide tour and will next perform November 13th in Tokyo, Japan. In addition, Steve Aoki released a new single, Wasted on Me, featuring BTS last week. And nothing but praise for the K-pop stars in an interview with Radio Disney. Aoki says, I love them. They're amazing. They're great guys, great friends, so talented. Chris Cornell's family sued the late Soundgarden singer's doctor for malpractice for harming his mental health prior to his death last year. The suit filed by his widow Vicki Cornell and their two minor children alleges Dr. Robert Koblen negligently and repeatedly prescribed Cornell dangerous mind-altering controlled substances, including oxycodone and the anti-anxiety drug lorazepam, also known as Afian. People reported the suit states Koblen feared to warn Cornell about the possible side effects of Lorazepam, and Pam and the drugs caused Cornell's judgment and caused him to engage in dangerous impulsive behaviors that he was able to control, which cost him his life. According to the suit, Koblen was prescribed Cornell 940 doses between September 2015 and his death in May 2017. Um, and, and it adds that Coblin was aware Cornell was an addiction-prone individual who would be more prone to symptoms of lorazepam, including risk of suicide because he was referred to Cornell through the late singer's therapist for substance abuse. Additionally, Coblin allegedly allowed his non-physician staff to write many of Cornell's prescriptions while unsupervised. Cornell was found dead at the age of 52 at an MGM Grand Detroit Hotel on May 18, 2017 hours after his band Audio Slave had performed in the city. His wife suggests his death resulted from overprescribed medication and autopsy and toxicology reports released shows that there were traces of seven different drugs in Cornell's system at the time of his death, including a significant dose of lorazepam. 
The medical examiner, however, said the manner of death was suicide and that drugs did not contribute to the cause of death. John Mayer, Chance the Rapper, and other musicians gathered to pay tribute to the late Mac Miller during a special event titled The Celebration of Life. The live stream special took place Wednesday at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. It featured videos of Miller from his childhood, live performances, and speeches given by the special guests. Proceeds were given to Mac Miller's Circle Fund, a charity which supports youth, art, and community building programs. Action Bronson, Anson Pack, Dylan Reynolds, Domo Genesis, Earl Sweatshirt, J.I.D., Miguel, uh, Josima, Schoolboy Q, SZA, Thundercat, Travis Scott, Ty Dolla Sign, and Vince Staples were in attendance while Pusha T, Pharrell, Lil Wayne, ASAP um, Ferg, and Tyler the Creator provided video tributes. Mayer took the stage to perform a cover of Miller's song Small Worlds that incorporates the rapper's voice and lyrics. Chance also performed and then gave a speech. Mac, thank you for so many different things. Thank you for the music you made. Thank you for the music that you provide other people with, for the opportunity that you provided me with, but overall for the friendship that you built through your music and through your artistry. Miller died at the age of 26 in September after a battle with substance abuse. And now, let's take a look at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this date in 1985, Miami Vice's soundtrack begins an 11-week run at number one. Almost from its beginnings, television showed a remarkable ability to influence the pop charts, and not only be by giving exposure to popular music artists on programs like American Bandstand and The Ed Sullivan Show. Many television programs also launched legitimate pop hits in the form of their theme songs, songs like the Peter Gunn theme, Welcome Back, and Theme from SWAT. But prior to 1985, no television program had ever launched a smash hit movie-style soundtrack album. The first one to do so was NBC's Miami Vice, a show that not only altered the landscape of television and fashion, but also sent the soundtrack album on the same name to the top of the Billboard 200 Albums charts on this date in 1985 a spot that would hold for the next 11 weeks. The genesis of Miami Vice is the stuff of television legend. It came about in the form of a memo from NBC's head of programming, Brad Tarkatov, in which he documented one of his brainstorms simply as MTV Cops. Inspired by MTV's growing influence on the music industry, Tarkov reason with a slickly produced visually uh, uh, arresting cop show could become a t uh, to television essentially what Duran Duran was to music under the creative guidance of producer Michael Mann Tartakov's vision took shape in 1984 when it debuted on NBC's fall schedule subsequently opposite opposite the ratings of the Juggernaut Falcon crash on Friday nights at 10 p.m. Miami Vice struggled in its first season but catapulted into Nielsen's top 10 in the autumn of 1985 Simultaneous, uh, uh, simultaneous with the television show's rise to popularity, its instrumental theme song by Czech's composer John Hammer was climbing the Billboard pop charts. The popularity of that single in turn drove sales of the soundtrack of album Miami Vice, which featured not only John Hammer's theme song and other examples of his incidental soundtracks, but also uh, several original songs written expressly for the show's fall season, including Smuggler's Blues and You Belong to the City by Glenn Fry. The album also featured previously released songs that had been featured prominently in the program's signature music montage, such as Phil Collins' In the Air Tonight and Tina Turner's Better Be Good to Me. In demonstrating how five scenes worth of difficult expository dialogue could easily be replaced with a 90 second uh, visual montage set to mood appropriate pop music, my advice made a significant creative impact on the future of American television. It demonstrated how much additional revenue a television show could generate by releasing soundtrack albums of pre existing popular music. It had a significant business impact as well. And that is your entertainment report for Friday, November 2nd, 2018. I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back on Monday to deliver some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Facebook.com slash The Entertainment Report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O on Twitter at The Enter Report or on Instagram at The Entertainment Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of The Entertainment Report anytime you want 
on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com or your iHeart phone app. Search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Everyone have a great weekend. Be sure to turn your clocks back. Good night, and God bless you all.